thank you so much, Dr. Manish, for that introduction and that detailed presentation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen in the audience, a little statistic here about the brilliance of the mind that's amongst us today. Dr. Manish has more than 75 research papers, more than 8,100 citations on Google Scholar, and he personally holds 19 patents in the US. So, Dr. Manish, taking uh, a cue from your Project Astro demo, from, uh, among all the other things that you talked about, clearly the AI that we are using now, that we become used to, is a fraction of what's really, what AI is really capable of in the years to come. How do you envision this developing? What sort of use cases do you see emerging from users? And how does the situational awareness capability kind of plug into that ecosystem? Yeah, see the basic thing you can now imagine is a really, really powerful, almost universal agent that will be available at the back end call for each and every one of us. What I showed you over there were learning kind of scenarios where somebody could just, let's say you are a learner, you could just point it to whatever, some question in your textbook and say, hey, help me answer this question or help me educate me on the concepts, right? That will help me answer that question. But it could be, I mean, something as mundane as uh, you take that agent and kind of make it scan everything in your refrigerator before you go shopping at your grocery store and then say, hey, tell me, are we out of milk? Uh, or a blind person having this assistant that can help them explore the world around us. They, they, they visit a new place and it can tell them where they are, it can tell them about enti the entire history or help them even navigate. So, so I think there's no limit to the kinds of, in fact, there are so many new applications that will emerge as these agents become even more powerful than what I showed today. A lot has happened at Google DeepMind over the last few weeks. There's the AI protein tool that you referenced, which has gone open source. There's even an AI tool to solve conflicts between human beings. The Gemini team is now part of DeepMind. How does that kind of build towards making AI more relevant for users and for the greater good? Right. No, that's an excellent question. So I think of it along two dimensions. One is, how do we make sure that the AI itself is being developed in a manner that it's not just working for a privileged few, whatever, for the Western world, but pretty much for every human on the planet, right? Which includes, again, doing all of this foundational work in terms of languages, making sure these models can scale to billions of users at a small cost, as well as applying them, right, in areas like agriculture. We've worked with nonprofits like Arman, which is into maternal and child health improvements, and the AI model has been deployed in production to help them, again, do a better job of saving uh, uh, the children's lives because the statistics are quite humbling. There's a woman who dies at childbirth every 20 minutes in India, uh, and uh, Dr. Aparna, who started that nonprofit, said, look, pregnancy is not a disease. Women should not be dying of childbirth. Childhood is not an ailment, but there are yet, there are children below the age of five who die, I think there's one child that I, dies again every few minutes. So, so how do we kind of bring those benefits? So that's one aspect. The other, I think, where I have been now really trying to get even academia in India excited is the possibilities of AI to accelerate science. What we saw with that protein folding and that protein structure prediction problem is just the tip of the iceberg. You name any problem, be it like discovering new materials, uh, be it like solving the problem of clean energy using fusion, uh, there is that expectation that AI can truly be an enabler to help us solve all of these problems. Generative AI has become so realistic over the last few months and years that there's now very little difference between a photograph that we may click versus a generation done using a prompt. How do you place the ethical considerations in that scenario? That's a very important kind of a question. So in fact, one of the technologies that Google recently made available in open source to the entire community is this synth ID, where what we do is we, it started with imaging, where we would watermark each image so that 
any time an image has been synthetically generated, it's watermarked and there's a very clear indication that this has been AI generated. It's not a natural or a human, uh, whatever, generated image. So we cr uh, extended that same technology to text, uh, videos and so on is being extended. So we are making technologies like these available so that when there is misinformation being created, uh, it, it, we are providing tools to help catch that. Then of course, we also talk about like search being a very, I mean search, you have to have trust in the information that comes back, right? When you're truly trust, uh, looking for that information. So which is why o AI overviews in Google comes with not only that AI generated summary, but all of the links that you can use to actually verify and validate, which serve as references for the information that has been provided to you. Right. Dr. Manish, father time waits for no one, which is why I must quickly ask you this. There have been instances of humans being unwilling to correct AI when AI gets it wrong. Students have got assignments wrong, legal professionals have got into a soup and courts. Are humans incapable of correcting technology when it gets it wrong? Uh, no, it's not a problem of incapability. I think part of it is also educating uh, people about the technologies, not just the potential, but also its limitations. Uh, in fact, some of my colleagues had done a human study earlier, and the title of that study was, because AI is always 100% correct. Because some of the people who were using these technologies, they believed that AI is that infallible kind of a gospel truth that is coming to them. So, so there needs to be that recognition, first and foremost, that that is not true. And in fact, in, in all of these Google products, we do, pr do provide those mechanisms where there is a thumbs up or thumbs down kind of a capability or in addition, there's also that capability for you to correct the AI model's output and provide better uh, output uh, to it. So yes, so I think part of it is developing greater awareness of what some of the, cap uh, the limitations of these technologies are apart from their amazing capabilities. Thank you so much, Dr. Manish. Thank you.